Okay, would you help us out just to all the ladies, not just moms, all the ladies, um, we have something for you here. David might need a hand, so I know somebody wants to help him out. Uh, Isaiah, would you need a hand? Uh, as they're doing that, Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, if you turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 10, again, we're celebrating moms today, thank you moms for all you do, thank you my mom for um, raising me, I guess, putting up with me and still being here supporting me after all I put you through, um, but thank you all, everyone here is, is considered a blessing uh, and the importance of, of women in their role in, in the church understanding that we're all uh, related within the church, that we're all brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and daughters and sons to one another. And so remember that we all have a valuable place in that aspect of it. As we move forward on this day, I'm going to share a few, going to share a couple different things. But first, let's recap where we've been as you receive this. I think most of you know, but we've talked about what happens after Easter, best day ever. Uh, what do we do now? And, and we talked about we don't just stand around and look at the sky and wait for Jesus to return. We do hope and are excited for the return of Jesus, but at the same time, we need to be active. And there are battles every Christian should be fighting. So the resurrection isn't about going to heaven someday only. Resurrection is not about just someday somewhere going to heaven. The resurrection is about the power of God in our lives today. And that's something that is absolutely critical, friends. We have to understand that the resurrection of Jesus makes life different every day from the moment you say yes on for all eternity. So if you're not experiencing the power of the resurrection changing your life, then you're missing out. Because that's what God wants to do here and now in you, not just one day a week, but all the time. He's that good of a God. He's that powerful enough. And the resurrection is that big of a deal. So we've looked at battles then. What are battles we need to be fighting as Christians? The resurrection means we're going to war. In a way, it does. We'll look more at that in a moment. But battles every Christian should be fighting. And first, I've said this repeatedly, and I don't know if you're tired of it, but that's okay if you are. But it needs to be said. We need to be careful who we let call us to battle. Now, sometimes... We let a member of our family call us to battle. And you may know what I'm talking about. There may be a relationship dynamic in your, in your family or extended family that when you're around that person, they're able to push the buttons and all of a sudden you're ready to go to war. Right? Nobody? No? Okay. That's just a mythical situation that might exist elsewhere. <laughs> we know that, that those things are reality. Maybe somebody you work with that is able to kind of just call you to battle. That's not the battles that Christians are called to fight. Ephesians 6 says, oh, we do not battle against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. So this is not our battle. Not our battle. We're going to do one thing for, for, this, uh, for this pair, and that is to what? Pray for them. So let's do that right now. Father, we pray today for our national leadership. Um, we pray, Lord, that their hearts would yield to you, that they would seek your wisdom, and that, Lord, you would lavish your wisdom upon them. Give them spirits of repentance, but also give them spirits of courage to step forward into what you call them, and therefore us too. Lord, may they hear your voice, may they hear your call to whatever battle you would have them praying into, and, and let them hear nothing else of the enemy. We pray your spiritual protection over them, not just our president and vice president, but our Congress. We pray over our Senate. We pray over our state leaders. We pray even over our city leaders. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. And we all say, Amen. 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 We're going to pray that way. That's what we're doing. We don't want to fight that battle. We want to fight the battles that matter most. Because we fight the wrong battles, and we'll lose the ones that are important. Not our actual physical houses but our spiritual homes that we're building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. So we talked about a battle against temptation. And we can talk about that battle every single week, because that's an ongoing war, isn't it? Talk about the battle against temptation. We talked about the battle for hope, the importance of battling for something, not just against something. We talked about the battle in prayer and how praying is the weapon that advances the kingdom. And we had talked about last week the battle against, the battle for, the battle in and with the church. We talked about battling against hypocrisy. We talked about battling 
for the church integrity. We talked about battling with our brothers and sisters and being a part of a church. And again, church isn't what happens right here, right now. This is, this is part of what we do. This is part of our gathering. But church is what happens 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so if you don't understand that part of church, then you're missing out on God's plan for this world and for your life. Okay? So think about that and, and ask yourself, when I think of church, do I limit it to what happens on Sunday morning? If so, Lord, help me to let go of that and to see what your plans are for your church. So for just a moment, let's do something a little different. Let's celebrate warriors who have gone before us in the battle. And I think you'll see a theme here, and it's intentional this morning. On your notes, you can write whatever you want on this part. It's just something that's there for you. This is something, because it's Mother's Day, it seemed good and important. And actually, I thought this was supposed to be the sermon until the Lord changed it um, recently and turned it to something different. So here we go. Eve. Eve was the one who was promised in Scripture that her descendant would crush the serpent. It's in Genesis chapter 3. She was promised that her descendant would crush the serpent. It was Rebecca in Scripture who ensured Jacob, her son, would receive the Lord's blessing. Jacob, if you don't know, later on wrestled with the Lord, and the Lord changed his name to Israel, and he became the father of the twelve tribes. It was Josheben who risked her life in hopes that her infant son Moses would live. You find that in Exodus 2. Also in Exodus 2, you find Mary, a prophet, the sister of Moses, who led the nation in worshiping the Lord after the Exodus. In Joshua chapter 2, you find a woman named Rahab, and it is her bravery, her courage, that saved her family's lives and earned her a spot in the lineage of Christ. Rahab was a prostitute, and yet her bravery, her willingness to trust in the Lord and stand up for the Lord and his people saved her family, and she is in the lineage of Christ, his genealogy. It is Ruth and her fierce loyalty in the book named Ruth that brought life and family to Naomi. And there's a king that descended from Ruth. Anybody know who that king was? Rich mentioned him this morning. David. It was Ruth's fierce loyalty that brought life and family to Naomi. A woman that you may not know, but you should, named Deborah. She had wisdom and bravery and led the nation and defeated the enemies of the nation. She was the, the female judge at the time, which was as close as they had at that time to a king or a queen, and her name was Deborah. In 1 Samuel, we read about Hannah and her faith in and her fear of the Lord, and that brings about the birth of a prophet, Samuel. Samuel, who Rich has been talking about first and second Samuel, a prophet who did many, many things for the Lord, and it was all about Hannah's faith in the Lord and fear of the Lord that brought about Samuel's birth. It was Esther who had bold intervention to save her entire nation, despite all the opposition that was against her and the risks that she had to take. It was a woman named Elizabeth who rejoiced at a long-awaited answer to prayer and said, his name is to be John the Baptist. It is Mary who was humble and righteous before the Lord, and she bore and raised the Son of God. <coughs> Women named Joanna and Susanna and Mary, a different Mary than the mother, supported the Lord financially, the Lord Jesus, during his ministry. Did you know that everywhere Jesus went, there's food to purchase, things like that? These three women are listed in Luke chapter 8 as the main contributors to supporting his ministry as he goes from place to place. The woman named Mary Magdalene washed the Lord's feet and was the first to see the resurrected Christ and was the first evangelist and missionary as she was sent from the empty tomb to tell the disciples about the resurrected Lord. And we read that in Luke chapter 7 and John chapter 20. In Acts chapter 2, they're not all listed, but a few of them are, including Mary, the mother of Jesus. 
They all were gathered together with the disciples and they received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the birth of the church. Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth is how she was described. As Paul was going and trying to make his way into Europe, the first place where he finally was able to actually have an impact in Philippi was with a single woman who was the first believer. And she was the first believer in the city that began to launch and support Paul's ministry throughout the rest of Europe. Women named Lois, Eunice, were instrumental in Timothy's faith. Timothy was a young pastor of a church under Paul's guidance and discipleship. And other names you might not know are Priscilla, Phoebe, Yodia, Syntyche, and many, many more listed in the New Testament were women who were key leaders in the early churches. Did you know all that? They all have one thing in common. What is it? They're all women. And they're all following the Lord. And they're all difference makers. As we talk about Mother's Day, just for a moment, and we celebrate warriors in the battles, we so often talk about the men in the story. But all along throughout the entire story, there are women in the story as well. Women who are leading, women who are serving, women who are risking their own lives, women who are brave, and women who do the work of prayer. And in the midst of all of that, we see that they are a valuable part of God's story in church. So ladies, know that you matter just as much as anyone. And then let anyone else ever say that you matter less because you are people. Do you hear me? Many of you support that. You better. <laughs> Since the Bible. All right? So we talk about battles. Ready for the next one? It's short and brief. And it'll probably convict you because I know it convicts me. Ready? We talk about the battle for space. The battle for space. And I'm not talking about this kind of space. I'm talking about that kind of space. I'm talking about the battle for space. This kind of space is different. Did you know, by the way, that, that moms love dad jokes? <laughs> and one of their favorite is, is, well, it's not a joke, it's a fact, that all the members of the enterprise, although they were different genders and they were different uh, from different you know, colors, different backgrounds, and even different planets, they all had three ears. They had a left ear, they had a right ear, and then in the middle of it all, they had the final front ear. <laughs> That's true. It's funny the longer you think about it. Yeah. We're not talking about that kind of battle. Let me show you some pictures, and I'm going to ask if you would like to be at any of these locations today and for the upcoming week, potentially the upcoming month. Uh, 
months and months ago, uh, make room. As we talk about making space or making room, it is key, friends, it is key. Don't underestimate how important this one is to the rest of the battles that you're called to fight. You want to battle for hope, you want to battle against temptation, you want to battle in prayer, you want to battle for the church. You need, in your life, to make space or room for that. So let's look at our Lord and Savior Jesus, and let's look at who he was and some of the things he did. You would agree with this statement, would you not? Jesus focused his life on a very important mission. you agree? Yes. Let's read about that. He said what his mission was in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 through 19. He's quoting prophecy from the book of Isaiah. Would you read it with me? Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus said that at the beginning of his ministry, and he went every place and said, Repent, therefore, for the kingdom of heaven is near. We know by the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven doesn't look like it looks like that. Good news, freedom, recovery. So we see those things, we understand. Jesus set his life on a very important mission, the mission was to bring people to the kingdom of God. At the same time, bring the kingdom of God to people. So as Jesus is healing, as Jesus is doing miracles, casting out demons, and raising the dead, all the things that Jesus does, he is bringing the kingdom of God to people. All in hopes that they will draw near to the kingdom, not just for a moment, for healing, but for the rest of their lives, for transformation. Are you with me? He brings the kingdom through all he does, through all he says, in hopes that the people will return and become a part of the kingdom for the rest of their lives. And so we see that. But we also see this about Jesus in Luke as well, chapter 5, just a chapter later. A chapter later after he declares his mission. And would you read it with me? Yet the news about him spread all the more. So the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Jesus begins his ministry. In, in moments, in days, in weeks, it, it explodes and it, it takes off. And there are people coming to him from every different place that they could possibly imagine in that time. Traveling for hours, traveling for days, traveling for weeks, just to catch Jesus. And as they do, and the crowds get lar larger, we see it again, verse 16, let's read one more time. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So Jesus, indeed, focused his life on a very important mission, bringing people to the kingdom of God. Yet he often stepped away from it. Not very productive. Not very productive. You imagine being in the middle of a, of a job, Lucas and Derek pouring concrete. And then right about the middle of it, you're like, ah, I'm going to take a couple days off. Painting, getting a wall half done, and walking away. How much more important is God's work through Jesus in building the kingdom, bringing it near people and bringing people to it? And yet Jesus often steps away from it. Friends, this is what we're talking about this morning, and this is what he does in addition to that, Mark chapter 6, verse 30 through 32. I trust you're not too tired to read a little bit more. <laughs> the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat. Now, hold on. Doesn't that sound like success? If you're talking about planting a, a ministry or starting a nonprofit or a church, and there were so many people coming and going, they didn't even have time to eat because the miracles were happening left and right. Don't you think that is successful? And yet, what is Jesus' response to that? He said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. <coughs> Jesus through whom all things were made, without him nothing was made, who was one with the Father, who was building his disciples, and you know by history it takes about three years to do all that he does, and yet he often, in the midst of what he's doing, withdraws 
and even takes those who are with him, invites them to step away too. <clears throat> Jesus called the church, the believers, to a very important mission. <clears throat> Do you believe that? Careful what you said. <clears throat> you say, yeah. And that means if you're part of the church, then you're saying, oh, you need to be doing something very, very important. Let's read what that is. We read it last week. And so John 14, 12 through 13. Would you read it for me, as I take care of this? Very truly, I tell you, all of that faith Right? 
So what does that look like? What does space and room look like? How does it happen? What can it be? Here are some answers. Space or room can be disconnecting from distractions, hitting the power button, leaving at home, turning it off, disconnecting from distractions, disengaging from distractions. And that can be both an internal thing and an external thing. Disconnecting from distractions. Space and room can be stopping what you're doing, pausing what you're doing in the middle of it all for a short period of time. If we took 60 seconds now and were absolutely quiet for 60 seconds and did nothing, I think we'd be astonished as to how long it is. But yet, how many chunks of 60 seconds do we just clump together and let it fly by? And yet we find no rest in those things. Space, room, can be disconnected from distraction, stopping, pausing for short periods of time. Which one should you do? Yeah, probably both. And disconnecting or and stopping can also mean space room can be days or nights away. As a pastor, when I started, I told the church that, that it was important that I take a sabbatical every seven years. And because they have not, had not yet fully hired me, they said, okay. And so I found that when we get to that time, um, if I have not taken it, and that's usually the case, it usually takes me eight or nine years on my own, not the church's fault, on my own to plan for it, um, then by that time, I am more than in need of it. And so if that's true for me, and I only work one day a week, how much more true is it for you? Thank you for laughing. Who work all the time, who are working spiritually and physically, Time away. Which brings us back to this. Oh, it's Mother's Day. I thought Mom would like to see this. <laughs> yes, I graduated with a master's degree and I spoke at graduation. And this is my cohort, or part of my cohort. This is a group that I journeyed with for two years to go through the master's program, studying ministry yourself, marriage, family, and community. And this is a period of one of the greatest depths, of, the greatest amounts of growth that I've had in all my years. This two-year stretch. It was space and it was room, but it was also a lot of work. How does that work, Chris? We're talking about burden that is easy and light. God called me to work on my master's degree. I, I did not, I had thought I would do it someday. And then the, the person who I always thought I would work under stepped away from him, like, okay, so I'm never going to have to do a master's degree. And then I got a call from a friend who said, I'm starting a new program, and I think you should be a part of it. And I said, I will pray about it. Many of you know the story. A couple months went by, and I prayed about it. And it was about two weeks before the master's program was to start, and I was flying home, and in the midst of that, the Lord said, well, you said you're going to pray about it. How about we do that now? And so I did. And even though it was the beginning of one of the busiest stretches of my life, the Lord said, this is where I want you, and this is where you need to be. So for two years, between the, my kids' 14th and 16th birthdays, as I was coaching two sports for the first time, and in that time, I would also be diagnosed with MS and be teaching religious release class and uh, leading a church and all these things, uh, the Lord called me to also do this tiny work of working on a master's degree. How? Because his birth is a yoke is easy and his burden is light. Friends, space and room we often think of being something where we just take time away and just disconnect. And if we do that often, then we say, okay, that's enough of that. But space and room can also be deeper intentional study. It can be a deeper pursuit. It can be taking more time in your Bible than that quick devotion that pops up on your phone in the morning. Or those last few verses you read right before you fall asleep. Devotion in the Lord and study in the Lord can be in a program where it can just be you and the Bible and a cup of coffee and an hour. And that can be space, and that can be room, and that can be a place where you find the Lord in greater depths than a week away. Space and room can involve focused prayer and listening. And friends, you've heard my story, you've heard my testimony. The times that God has spoken loudest and clearest to me were times that were extended times of focused prayer and listening. And yes, it can also involve rest. What I do not want you to hear this morning, and what I do not want your conclusion to be is, you know, this is right. 
I'm going to take the next couple weekends, the next couple Sundays off, and I'm just going to sit outside. <laughs> because worship, study, growing, fellowship can be some of the greatest rest you can find. So here's the question as we start wrapping up. How do I know when I need rest? How many of you don't know the answer to that question yet? <laughs> if you don't know if you need rest or not, here are some questions you can ask yourself. Am I struggling to connect with the Lord in ways that I've been able to in the past? If your answer is yes to that question, are you struggling currently to connect with the Lord and your answer is yes, I'm not as close to the Lord as I have been in the past, then you need space and you need room. Simple. Right? If you're not sure still, am I overly burdened? Then in space or room. Now let me warn you, friends, that if you're overly burdened and you intentionally take time to find space and room to seek the Lord, you know what will happen is He will probably ask you to let go of some of those burdens. So you need to enter that willing to obey your Lord and Savior wherever He calls you. And then a final question that you can ask is Are my priorities at place? Are they all whack? Am I chasing things that I shouldn't be chasing? Is there chaos in my home? Is there chaos in my own personal heart? If there is, then I need to create space and room. So then the big question is, how in the world do I do that? Simple. It depends on you. It depends on you. Each of you is different. Take a moment, look around. Anybody see a mirror image of themselves? We don't have any twins. So nobody sees a mirror image of themselves, correct? You're all unique. You're all very, very different. All wonderful people. Some of you are make plan people. They're like, I know I'm going to do this. I'm going to list it out. I'm going to make a plan. I'm going to set goals. I'm going to measure those goals. I'm going to accomplish those goals. You people are great, but you're not me. Some of you are spur of the moment people. You're like, you know, now seems like a really good time to do what I just heard about. If you're a little bit more like me. Some of you are, as you go along, you are always kind of processing and planning and working and dialoguing about it and finding yourself there. So it depends on what type of person you are as to how you go about it. If you're a planner, if you're a listener, then go ahead. Plan intentionally for rest. But don't make it a burden to say, Lord, I want to know how I can just create a space in this crazy calendar where I can seek you. Good? If you're a spur of the moment, then spur yourself on. Because if you wait for it to happen, it's going to take longer than these. Or ask somebody else to help you. So part one, you need to, it depends on who you are as to how that's going to happen. Part two, you need to be determined and, and understand this is a battle, friends. If you don't fight this battle, guess what? Nobody else is going to fight it for you. You probably don't work in a place where your boss is saying, you know, I think you could use some time off. I'm going to pay for you to go to a really nice place like one of those pictures that you saw on Sunday morning. Right? You don't have that boss. No. I know you don't. You work for me, baby. We are looking for a youth pastor. Be determined. You have to battle for this. It has to be a priority. You have to fight for it. And the third thing is ask for help. Um, I remember a, a powerful, powerful conversation with a, a family, a young family, as they were talking and as, as I listened to them, I just was prompted by the Spirit to ask question after question, and it began to unveil this tangle of burdens to where they had zero time for each other, zero time for their kids, and zero time for the Lord. And yet they longed for all of those things so very much. And as we talked about that, they were able to ask for help and ask for wisdom, and it created an accountability to where they actually then really needed to take steps. Friends, I am here for you if you need that, and that those around you are there as well. So let's close by looking at Mark chapter 10, verse 13 through 16. It's not in your notes, it's on the screen, it's in your Bibles. It seems like maybe an odd jump, but it won't be once we get there. But you, uh, I guess you can read it along with me on the overhead. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus saw this. He was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, 
He placed his hands on them and blessed them. Friends, let me ask you a really dumb question. Do you want to enter into the kingdom of God? If the answer is yes, then Jesus tells you how you do so. How is it? Like a little child. When it comes to creating space and room, one of the biggest battles you have to fight is an internal battle against yourself. Because there is a part of you that wants to be the rebuking disciple. And the rebuking disciple is chiding the inner child. The child that God has known since birth. The child that God created in the inmost parts, who knit together the child that God knows, and the child that has to come to Him. That is how we come to the Lord. But there's a part of us, Brendan Manning calls it the imposter. There's part of us that says we're better than that. And we chide ourselves for being childlike and longing to sit or be in the arms of Jesus so that he might place his hands on us and bless us. There's a part of us that says, well, no, I need to man up. No, I don't have time. I need to be responsible. There's too much riding on the situation. And Jesus says, unless you come to me like a little child, unless you can get deep down to that part of you that is still crying out for God to love him, you can't come. And so the biggest battle for space involves that internal battle and it has to go back way deep. And this is where you need a little bit of help, probably. But just to go back and say, Lord, I, I want to come to you as a child. Help me to remember when I was a child. And help me to kill it, go over all this other stuff so that I might come to you. That's a deep and profound statement that takes time to go through. But that's what we're going to leave for today. when we're talking about this battle for space because we need to move forward. And it's Mother's Day. And you all have extravagant plans for your moms. You knew not to give them a gift because you knew you were going to give them one this morning in a pink box that you all planned and I just cooperated with you so that you would get the credit. The resurrection of Jesus has power for you today, friends. So let's look at this prayer that you can pray as we talk about doing this process. So, so follow along with me. Lord, I come to you as a child longing to know you more. Help me to find and use space to get away to be with you. I want to know that your burden is easy and light, and I want to find rest for my soul. What a prayer. That is a prayer that our Lord invites us to pray and to walk into. So let us pray together. I pray in the spirit of that prayer. Father, I thank you.